Paul, I really enjoy the videos and documentaries. Recently the question that came to me is, Jesus always spoke of his father. In the original languages, did Jesus ever use the name of the Old Testament God Yahweh? Did Jesus read the Old Testament as a story of paleo contact? Ah, George, that's a great question, and it's a $64,000 question. So the first part, uh, no, Jesus never used the word Yahweh anywhere in his teachings. When Jesus talked about God, he used the Greek word theos, which people understood to mean the creator, the source of the cosmos and everything in it. And in fact, the Apostle Paul gives that as the Christian definition of Theos in the book of Acts. So Jesus refers to God as Theos. He also refers to him as the Father. And in his famous prayer, he says, Pater, Hamon, Ho, En, Tois, Uranois. Father, the one in the skies, the one in the heavens, just to distinguish from any other potential father. So we've got Theos, Pater, and then he addresses Pater as Abba, which is a word that could mean daddy or dad, or could mean sir. That's the language that Jesus uses. Now, some might say, well, he quotes Yahwist texts. And yes, he does. But almost every time he does that, he does it to find a a prophetic meaning or an esoteric meaning. He almost never goes to the Yahweh's text for their plain meanings. And he distances himself from Yahweh's law. All the gospel writers present Jesus as a successor to Moses and a replacement of Moses and Jesus's laws as a replacement of the Yahweh's laws. So Jesus says, you've heard it said, but I say this. He also distances himself from some of the Yahwist stories. And uh, I go into this in, in some of my videos on the fifth kind and the Paul Wallace channel. So he doesn't use the word Yahweh. He uses other language. He doesn't endorse the Yahweh stories. And this was clear to the primitive church. In Acts 15, they make a decision that Christianity is not going to be built on the Yahweh stories or the Yahweh laws. In Colossians 2.14, it talks about the cancellation of those written laws. So the early Christians were very clear that Jesus had moved on from Yahweh. And Jesus also said, uh, you do not know me nor my father. If you love my father, you would also love me. He says this in the Gospel of John. So he's separating himself and his father from the Jewish stories of uh, their father, Yahweh. So the second part is interesting. If Jesus didn't regard um, these as divine stories, how did he regard them? Um, in the early church, we had church fathers who sought to teach the church to read the scriptures the way Jesus read them. And key figures would be Origen and Clement of Alexandria. And so when they went to the Yahweh stories, and the Elohim stories, they didn't regard them as God's stories. And they said, if we read these as God's stories, we would have to believe of God such things as we would not believe of the most savage and unjust of men. They also identified that there was some other kind of entity washing around in those texts, which they called the craftsman or the demiurge, and this is language from Greek culture. And they never quite say what they think this being is, except it's very powerful, powerful enough to do terraforming. It's not human. It's not divine. It's something else. Now, we might have other language for that kind of being. We have the language of alien or extraterrestrial or interdimensional. They didn't have that language. They talked about the, the demiurgos, the craftsman. And when they gave that teaching, they believed they were being true to Jesus's handling of those texts. Now, Paul knew Plato, knew Greek thought like the back of his hand. And again, Origen, Clement of Alexandria, believed they were continuing in Paul's tradition. Origen encouraged people not to read the plain meaning because that would be monstrous. 
Clement of Alexandria did the same. And the school of interpretation that resulted from that is often called the Alexandrian school. And it's the mainstream approach to interpretation to hermeneutics in the Eastern Orthodox Church. And it's built on the idea that you can't take those stories at face value as God stories. So did Jesus regard the Elohim and Yahweh stories as stories of extraterrestrials? Well, that might be adding two and two together and getting four and a half, but it's not far beyond. If, like Paul, he understood that these texts had to be handled differently, and that's why he always handled them differently, we have to ask them, what did he think these beings were? Not human, not divine, something else. Our language is extraterrestrial, but I think it's safe to say Jesus regarded certainly that those entities were something else. Otherwise, he would have handled those scriptures entirely differently. Is it true that Plato taught that we live in a holographic universe? If so, where is that in Plato's writings? Kyle, thank you for that. This is a fascinating question. I get asked this quite often. And the idea of a holographic universe has, of course, become much more popular since the Matrix movies, which have put forward the idea that what we experience as reality isn't really the prime reality. It's the projection of something happening in an abstract realm of maths or of codes, and that everything we experience is really the download of coding. And yes, Plato did teach something along those lines. He wasn't the first person to come up with that idea. You can find it in Buddhism. Buddhism teaches the idea of Maya, the idea that what we experience as reality is really an illusion. And that at some point we have to wake up from that illusion if we're to be enlightened. And this is something that Blaise Pascal uh, took and ran with as well. But the way Plato approaches it, there are a couple of things that he does in his teaching that relate to this idea of holographic universe. And the first is in Plato's teaching about forms. And he says that everything we see is really the download of something from an abstract realm of ideas. And so every dog, for instance, that we see is the download of the idea of a dog. And because we were from that realm of forms before we became material beings, we have enough subconscious memory of what a dog should be that we can assess all the dogs in the world and decide which are the better downloads, which are the more perfect downloads. So Plato had that language where everything really exists as an idea or a form before it's downloaded. And so the, the real causation of everything we see here is in some other uh, unimaginable realm where everything is mathematics or ideas or codes. So we could look to his language there and say, well, that's kind of similar to the idea of a, a projected universe or a holographic universe. And we could go and find nuts and bolts versions of Plato's thinking in the real world today. And if we wanted to do that, I would suggest going to paleobiology, going to DNA research, because if I give you an example, the, the conventional theory is that today's whales are the descendants of either some kind of a bear or some kind of a cow. Uh, but the problem with the Darwinian model is that you have to get from a bear to a whale or a cow to a whale in stages, each one of which gives a survival advantage. And so at some point, you have to have a functional blowhole on the top of your head. And prior to that, another functional blowhole somewhere else. You have to have a functional fish-shaped tail that emerges before it gives you a survival advantage. You have to have skin that can survive underwater before you've got a survival advantage. And so it seems that there are these leaps that have to be made in order to get from bear to whale or cow to whale. And I got into conversation with some paleobiologists about this problem in evolutionary theory. And uh, 
one person in particular I was talking to who was deeply into this topic, had PhDs coming out of his ears on the topic, said, actually, it's more interesting even than that, because many of these changes have to happen all in one go. So you have to have the, the blowhole move at the same time that the type of skin changes and the type of eye changes and the uh, respiratory system changes and the fish-shaped tail emerges. They all sort of have to happen together. Well, how does that work, I said. And he said, well, what it is is that there is a group of codes that belong together that will generate a tail and there's a group of codes that belong together that will generate that kind of eye and those groups of groups of codes all belong together so that what will happen is that those codes will get downloaded and hey presto you have this kind of whale this group of groups of codes will get downloaded hey presto you've got an orca and i realized that he was putting into nuts and bolts terms again the idea that Plato had put out there, that the, that the coherent whale exists in code form before it's downloaded. So when you read Plato, it might sound all very abstract, but you get into biology and you realize, well, no, actually, he's talking about something that's very close to what is spoken today as nuts and bolts reality. But another place you can go to if you want to find the idea of holographic universe is Plato's language of the cave, where he quite literally uses the language of projection and says that everything we perceive is a projection of the real thing. We're seeing shadows. And because of the rules of uh, our engagement in this life, we can't actually see the real causation. We're only seeing projections and shadows. But at some point, enlightenment must mean that we escape the cave, we can walk into the daylight, and we can see the real things for themselves. And when we do that, at first it's very disorienting, and then it's very upsetting to realize how limited our view has been. And then we're upset for the people still trapped in the cave who have this tiny understanding of reality and we realize we have to go back in and rescue people, but we can't tell them everything all at once. Otherwise, they'll think we're crazy. And Plato is obviously describing himself slash Socrates in that moment. And so he's suggesting that getting beyond uh, the reality that we see, getting beyond the causalities that we understand, is something that does actually happen to people in this life, that the enlightenment experience or the awakening experience is something real, and that he would be one such person who's had this awakening experience and is now trying to teach people and help people without telling them everything all at once so that they'll think he's crazy. So for him, I think the idea of holographic universe was something very, very real and something that he wanted to wake people up to. Hey Paul, loved your interview with Emilio Ortiz. A thought crossed my mind when you were talking about the Tower of Babel incident. Did we lose our telepathic ability there? Got confused and needed all those languages? Is it a metaphoric story that was used to convey the message? Thank you, Ben. Well, telepathic abilities uh, in the past, the idea that our ancestors had more of those than we do, is an idea that you can find in narratives around the world. I was at a gathering just recently of Aboriginal Australian elders, and it's deep in their cultures, uh, this idea that telepathic connection is something we should all be capable of and something that our ancestors were better at and that somehow, to a degree, we've lost you can find it also in the Mayan story of human origins in the Popol Vuh. It isn't something I find in the story of Babel, to be honest. So I'm not dissing the idea because I'm saying it's got legs in other traditions, but I haven't found it in the story of the Tower of Babel. The conventional reading of that story is that we go from a world where everybody speaks the same language to one where there's a multiplicity of languages. And this is done as a, uh, a disruption of a coherent civilization. That's, that's the surface level of the story. 
except that the story doesn't say that we went from all speaking Esperanto or whatever it was, and it was multiplied into English and French and German and Mandarin, Dutch, so on and so forth. It doesn't talk about a multiplying of language. It talks about a destruction of language, a loss of language. The people in Genesis 11 go from being a very developed and technological society to being people who no longer could communicate with one another. So that's a loss of speech. Uh, that's, that's the real horror of that story, that something has been done, the neurological interference at such a level that society is going to have to re-evolve. And it's the brutality of that story that really clued me that um, this might not be a God story. And when I drilled into the root meanings of the key words, I found, oh, this is another Elohim story. This is a story of ancient contact. So that's how I would read it. Not, not a loss of telepathy, though I think that is in our human story, but a loss of language. Do you believe ETs are visiting our planet in order to harvest souls? Have you found any evidence for this in world mythology? That's a great question, Rachel. I, I have been asked this question quite a few times, and it clearly is an anxiety for some people who study these topics. What is the alien agenda? I think there are many, in fact. I don't think there's a single agenda behind the contact experiences that we're having today and that we've had throughout history. Harvesting souls, I think, may be a, a distortion of what's really going on. I have come to believe that our neighbors are interested in the human experience. I think there's something unique about the way human beings experience and process consciousness. Now, I think that all biological life in the cosmos hosts and experiences consciousness, but we do it in slightly different ways. And I think there's something unique about our cocktail of animal strength and mammal emotion and higher intelligence that means that we have a very colorful experience of uh, being conscious and that we have a unique facility in emotion, for instance, and imagination and creativity and compassion. And that this is what interests our neighbors. They want an experience of consciousness that is more colorful, which, which ours is. It can be very painful, but it can be very stimulating and enjoyable as well. And I think it's, it's that that's being studied by some of our neighbors and some of the experiences that contactees report uh, and that have led some people to think, are they trying to harvest our souls? I think, no, they're actually trying to study our souls. They're trying to study our consciousness. They test us uh, and provoke us in ways to observe our emotions, observe our reactions, observe our bonds as groups, because there is actually something very beautiful about the human experience. And I think it's that that's going on. I understand that. Around the 7th century BC, some Hebrew scholars edited ancient texts and rearranged them into a form that promoted a monotheistic worldview. I also understand that the word Elohim should be interpreted by its root meaning a plural term that designates the powerful ones. However, since this new text was written in Hebrew, for a Hebrew audience, how could there be any ambiguity regarding the fact that Elohim was a plural form? Thanks, Geronimino, for that question. How could there be any ambiguity? That's a very good question, because it isn't hard to see that the word Elohim is a plural word. It's a masculine plural form, and it's often followed by plural verbs and plural behaviors. The Elohim argue with each other. They have discussions among each other. They disagree. They go to war against each other. How could it be missed? And I think the answer is that in communities of faith, uh, people tend to put a lot of weight on their teachers and less weight on their individual perceptions when they study the scriptures. And it would certainly be a stretch to say, for instance, that every Christian has read the whole Bible and deeply studied it. But uh, even if a person has, uh, 
and they say, hang on, there are some anomalies here. If you take those to your youth pastor or your pastor or your vicar or your priest, very often you'll be given an answer that simply points to the mainstream view of God, angels, demons, the devil, human, animal, vegetable, mineral, and nothing else. And uh, the answer may not satisfy you, but unless you're a particularly bullish kind of person, you're probably not going to get into a to and fro debate with your pastor as to whether he or she has actually got that right. You're more likely to come away and feel slightly dissatisfied with the answer. And, you know, preachers are as time starved as, as anyone else. And often they don't probe into some of these anomalies and some of these questions. I was just very lucky that I suffered this ultimate Frisbee injury that I talk about in Escaping from Eden that gave me a time of convalescence where I could drill down into some of these questions. And so I think people in churches and synagogues are time starved as well. And they might not have the time to follow their curiosity or, or to probe the texts when an answer hasn't satisfied them or to read the text sufficiently for themselves. And so the default is that we just carry on with the narrative that gets rehearsed from week to week in our communities of faith. And we never get back to our questions. So I think that's that's the how that it happens. I've forgotten the first half of the uh, question, but I, I think the fundamental point is that Elohim really is a masculine plural form. It represents a plurality of beings whose interactions we can read in the texts. And when we read it that way, it becomes clear that the Elohim stories are a summary form of the Mesopotamian stories of the Anunnaki. And it's that correlation that really confirms we're reading it the right way. I am fascinated by your work, Paul. My question pertains to your mention of Pope Benedict XVI's spokesperson, Dr. Guy Consul Magno, and his statement that the Bible is full of aliens. You note that this was the impetus to your renewed inquiry into the Old Testament. Do you know where I could find his statement? I'd very much appreciate it. Michael, that is a great question. I found when I was researching the first in the Eden series, Escaping from Eden, that there were many papers available and statements available from Reverend Dr. Guy Consolmagno, who was the senior astronomer at the Vatican Observatory, from Father Jose Gabriel Funes, the director of the Vatican Observatory, and from Monsignor Carrado Balducci, who was the Vatican's senior advisor in paranormal ministry. They had done lots of press briefings in anticipation of the 2009 colloquium, where they discussed the theological implications of contact with other civilizations. Lots of prep and then lots of briefing after it. So there were lots of statements out there that were easy to find. And so I quote some of those in Escaping from Eden and in the second in the series, The Scars of Eden. And I'm very glad I did because it's now very hard to find them indeed. Uh, and I don't know if that's just the way the internet works, that uh, we've moved on, other things are being looked at, but it is now very difficult to find those quotes so you'll find them in my books, and I don't have any links to hand, but I will, uh, I'll go digging. Uh, I'll find what links uh, I have that still lead to something, and I'll put them up on the uh, fifthkind.tv website.